to this webinar from early warning to early action empowering and inspiring the next generation and this is jointly being organized by the water youth network the associated program on flood management which is a joint initiative of the world meteorological organization and the global water partnership and the anticipation hope and overall we wanted to really mark world meteorological day which happened on wednesday and bring together all these wonderful communities. And my name is Lydia Komsky, and I am uh, the Partnerships and Community Engagement Advisor at the Anticipation Hub. And I've also been a volunteer at the Water Youth Network for the past seven plus years. So I'm super happy to be moderating this webinar and bringing all together the great work from these different communities and um, making sure that we can capture different opportunities for young professionals um, moving forward. And I'm super excited to connect the humanitarian, the water and development and the development sectors, because um, only really when we're working together can we actually translate early warning into early action. So before we get started, I have a little exercise. It's just going to take one minute and um, we, want to, we want to ask you a very quick question. I'm seeing some uh, names come in in the chat. Thank you everybody for doing that. Looks like we have a really nice mix of participants um, from all over the world and different organisations too. Great to see uh, Christian Aid here and Start Network and Cruise, Rhymes. Great. Welcome, welcome everybody. Yes, yeah, so I have a quick little, um, little task for everybody. So everybody go to the chat box and I'm going to ask you all to write two words. So just two words about why you think youth or young professionals are important for translating early warning into early action. So don't press enter. So just write the two words um, and then in about 15 seconds, just when everybody can write the words, has their, their words written, we're going to press enter and we're going to create a flash flood um, with all of these all of these different words telling us why youth are so important. So everybody, have you written your words? I'm going to write mine. OK, has everybody written? Can I get some thumbs up? Those who are familiar with uh, with using the different tools down the bottom. Great. OK, so we're going to start the flash flood in five, four, three, two, one. Go. Oh, great. Exciting. Future, community, learner, technology, change makers, energy, innovation, innovation. Great. Enthusiasm. Wonderful. Rapid dissemination. Future leaders. Yay. <laughs> Generate knowledge. Wonderful. This was really nice. Thank you, everybody, for contributing. Hopefully this can be the start of uh, lots of interactivity during uh, during the event today. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Johannes Kuhlmann, and he is the director for Water and Cryosphere at the World Meteorological Organization and was previously the director at the Climate and Water Department. Johannes, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule and for speaking to us today. And um, yeah, we really appreciate it. So thank you so much and over to you. Lydia, uh, you're on mute, Johannes. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the disease of the Generation X. So, uh, thanks for the intro. I'm happy that we can um, link briefly today. I, I hope that this is not a one-off thing, but that uh, really some of you might really um, work much more closely with us in the future, because if you have this buzzword, early warning, early action on this buzz phrase. Now, this is really not so much about the early action. I mean, that's logical. You, If you do early warning, you want to have a result of it. And the problem that we had with classical systems in the past is that our early warning systems are technically very good, but they're, say, in that part where people are informed, they're just clumsy and don't work and it depends on telephone calls and people sleeping or not sleeping and we had this big flood last year in Germany uh, we had floods in Australia now where we lost people in in Mozambique a couple of years ago it's always the breaking point between what an early warning system can technically do and what people need to act upon 
a system that sits somewhere deus ex machina and predicts something so and i really believe that only if we take the common stuff that you are all handling every day and and as uh, as i said i'm gen x I, i'm not super good at modern communication technology but you are so you we need you for that we need to rethink our early warning early action connectors and i think they will only be uh, effective if we include all the modern stuff that's developing i don't know that <clears throat> if i say TikTok, you're probably laughing at me and i have no clue how to do that or if that's the latest or what the latest is but we we definitely need the that potential that all of you have to make those systems effective. And there's another fun fact or interesting fact, which is that people change their behavior, not because I say it, the Pope says it, or a politician says it, or a firefighter says it, but because people talk about things um, at the dinner table. So the most powerful way how things are transported and act upon is actually the family context or the friends context and we and if i think i have a family and i am uh, sometimes wondering how my how my children communicate and what they do but i i agree that this yeah peer-to-peer -peer communication is what we need to include for early action and the, the other aspect that was also in your in your um word cloud here is uh, we need to make sure that we don't build the systems for old people because it, it's the young people who need to give us the requirements and who need to tell us what they expect from these systems. So you need to be, I don't think, inspired. I think you need to be empowered. And that's a two way thing. A, we have to give you the space and respect and seriousness that you need to be able to define what early action looks like and you need to also be super bold and naggy and tell us old guys mostly old guys unfortunately uh, what you want and how you can be involved so one nice example is this uh, project on uh, flood and drought uh, innovation that apfm has been running together with a couple of people here in the call and i know that there's 10 good ideas who are now in the second stage of the review of this call. So for me, what is at the moment is a good sign. There is a lot of youth engagement and youth empowerment. We are working with uh, the Water Youth Network, with the Young Hydrological Society. We have something that's called Unify, and maybe Ramesh can share the link to that later as well, where we want to make sure that young people's voices are taken serious in next year's un big conference on water and early warning in your context here is one of the two sides i think of, of climate change adaptation and preparedness and resilience the other one being how can we manage water as a resource but uh, i think um i've probably eaten up my time in in addressing you i i am thrilled that so many young people are interested and please stay connected and please uh, uh, use the channels that Ramesh and all the other people in this call here um, can provide you to connect and to stay in contact and if you want to contact me I'm happy to um, yeah discuss further with you in the future so enjoy the day enjoy the good program that we have and sorry for speaking a bit lengthy bye Wonderful. Thank you so much, Johannes, for joining. Some very powerful words there and how young professionals and youth can really act as, as the connectors and the social connectors to the communities and really being bold. And it's a very strong, strong message there. And tell tell us, tell, tell the community what we need um, and what we want to see in terms of early warning and early action going forward. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johannes. Um, thanks again, especially for taking the time out on your on your en route travels. Thanks again. Great. Okay, so without further ado now, I would like to give you a little bit more background in, into the different initiatives um, 
that are kind of coming together in this in this webinar. So we have the Anticipation Hub, we have the Water Youth Network, we have the Associated Programme on Flood Management. So I'm just going to show you a couple of slides just to give you a little bit of a background on some of these different initiatives. And, um, and then that will set the, set the stage for um, the announcement of the winner of the competition on the global, um, global, youth, global flood and drought competition. And then we will move to our panel discussion. So I'll just spend a couple of minutes, a couple of minutes on this and then we'll move forward. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Anticipation Hub, it is a, a, a knowledge, uh, learning and sharing platform. Um, which is providing uh, guidance and advocacy support around anticipatory action, supporting um, practitioners, scientists and policymakers. It's an initiative of the German Red Cross, um, supported by the IFRC and the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Centre. And it brings together over 90 partners um, across academia, across NGOs, the Red Cross Red Crescent, governments, UN agencies, you name it, the Anticipation Hope Partnership is, is working on bringing it together. And this initiative was really built on, um, was really built on all of the experience within the Red Cross Red Crescent around forecast-based financing um, and connecting this to all of the other work around um, anticipatory action. And we're super happy to have uh, the Water Youth Network now as our 90th partner of the Anticipation Hub. And I'm very happy to see that Cara Siahan, the head of the Anticipation Hub, is in the, is in the audience here as well. So Cara, if you want to say hello, you're very welcome too. Thanks, Lydia. I just want to be quick. Uh, it's, it's a, again, a packed program. Just to say thank you for everyone for, for, for joining. It's a really untapped potentials in working with the next generation on early warning, early action. So Lydia, speakers and participants, thanks uh, again for, for uh, joining this exciting event. And I look forward to learning from all of you. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Cara. Yeah, wonderful. We definitely have lots of things happening with the Anticipation Hub in the coming year and really looking forward to working together with Water Youth Network and, um, and WMO and many others on, on, on uh, different activities. And so, yes, next up. So in terms of um, the other activities, so the Water Youth Network. So many of you are our members of the Water Youth Network have already engaged in the Water Youth Network. Um, so it's overall a global connector in the water sector, and it's made up of a vibrant community of students, young professionals um, across different disciplines. And one group within the Water Youth Network is the Disaster Risk Reduction Group, which was actually set up um, after uh, Sendai in 2015 and the Disaster Risk Reduction Framework. Um, and then in 2017, we launched the Early Warning Systems Young Professionals uh, group within the Disaster Risk Reduction team. And really the driver for setting this up was the need for um, connecting uh, young professionals working on those different components of early warning systems. So moving from the risk knowledge, the um, the forecasting and warning, the risk communication, warning communication, like Johannes was speaking about, and then the preparedness and the response. So really bringing in those early action protocols, which um, the forecast based financing and anticipatory action movement are really, uh, really focusing on. So really trying to join the dots and bring together the different disciplines, the different expertise um, across the government actors, also the NGOs, the practitioners, and the scientists as well, and the university. So really trying to bring together this community. And that was really the driver behind um, setting up this this group and we've engaged in, in different activities. So we um, submitted posters for the uh, Multi-Hazard Early Warning Conference even back in 2017 and then in 2019 we were actively engaged in the organising committee for the Multi-Hazard Early Warning Conference and organised a side event. So that picture is from that one. We've also engaged in different activities like producing um, a policy brief in the uh, WMO Bulletin around the important role of, of young professional engagement. So overall, we've been trying to kind of bring together this, this group of, um, of uh, early career professionals to really drive forward um, the need to work across disciplines and, and span boundaries to actually enable early warning and early action, really importantly. So yeah, that's the that's the Water Youth Network, and then another initiative which the Water Youth Network, so different branches, um, has supported, which also connects very much to this agenda, is the Associated Program on Flood Management, and the Water Youth Network is one of the support based partners of the Associated Pro Program on Flood Management, which is a joint initiative of the WMO and the Global Water Partnerships. 
and um, we have two focal points from the Water Youth Network, so Nevedita and uh, Alexa, and they are both here today, so you can give a wave and, and say hello. And um, on that note, we have a very exciting news because um, Nevedita and um, Alexa have been working very hard with um, with the Associated Programme on Flood Management around a competition and uh, these uh, the winners of the competition have been announced uh, yesterday and we are very happy to have these two winners with us today. So I'm going to hand over to Navita and she is going to tell you more about this competition and uh, then we're going to hear from the winners very shortly. So Navita, over to you. Uh, thank you, Lydia, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining this wonderful event on youth engagement. So uh, moving on to the competition, uh, in November 2021, uh, the uh, IDMP Integrated Drought Management Program and Associated Flood Management Program, which is a joint initiative of GWP and WMO in partnership with Water Youth Network, we launched a competition, which is youth-led competition, Global Integrated Flood and Drought Management. And we had uh, submissions from all over the world uh, uh, to be uh, roughly seven countries and each and every idea was very interesting and the main objective of this competition is to acknowledge uh, promote and encourage the involvement of young professionals in the early warning uh, early warning systems. So uh, as a part of this competition, we had three stages and in the second stage, 10 finalists were shortlisted and they have been given a capacity building workshop uh, in order to uh, giving them uh, motivation and also on how to pitch their ideas in front of the juries. So in mid-March, the finalists submitted their proposals and on the World Water Day, March 20, 22nd, so uh, the uh, for 10 finalists presented their ideas and their live pitches in front of jury panel uh, from WMO, GWP and WIN. And I'm so happy and excited to announce the two winners to all of you. And yeah, these are the two winners of this competition from... Uh, and Indonesia. So we have Eric Tamba Mianli, uh, who is the, from the College of Science and Education and also part of organization known as Youth Mappers. And we have Graziella Ariana Ola and her team uh, from Indonesia. Uh, she works for the Meteorological Climatology and Geophysics Organization in Indonesia. So now uh, we have the winners uh, who will present their ideas shortly to you. And over to you, Eric. Yes, hello everyone. I hope you can hear me loudly and clearly. Um, my name is Eric um, Nyari from Tanzania and my experience from this competition has been amazing and uh, my project aims at um, addressing flood challenges in Morogoro. Um, so the topic or the title, or the, I mean, I can say the main objective is uh, mapping flood protection zone and evacuation loads. Um, so through that, we use um, geographical citizen science, where also non-professionals, including the youth in marginalized groups, can be involved in the project. So I'm looking forward um, to this, and thank you, um, the jury and everyone who um, supported us in throughout the competition. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. And now we have we present Graziella to you. Over to you, Graziella. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Can hear me clearly. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Graciela Olua as the representative from the team AWAKE, Awareness and Knowledge About Early Warning. By AWAKE, we mean that this project hopefully be a new movement in disaster preparedness to work inclusively. Our team consists of four people, my friends Fini, Rendra, and Doni. We live in Papua and work as meteorological forecaster for the MKG. Thank you for the team and the jury for trusting us to deliver the project to develop the project. Uh, like the team's name, our main concern is about raising awareness on early warning system for children and people with disabilities. Uh, why is this essential? First of all, when we are talking about early warning system, we are talking about the whole system, not only how advanced the system is, but also how effective the warning is, like helping the society. So we choose to so see early the warning. The first one would be uh, the child center preparedness, and the second one is having people with disabilities as a center in disaster preparedness. Um, yeah, I guess that's all. I think that's all the highlight of the project. Uh, to another young professional in this field, know that our dedication is needed in building an insightful society for the better future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Graziella. Thank you, Eric. And yeah, over to you, Lydia. Great. Thank you so much. How exciting. 
Isn't this amazing? Yeah, well done. Congratulations. Big achievement and a huge thank you to the Associated Programme on Flood Management and to the Water Youth Network Focal Points for, for pulling this together. I mean, what a great opportunity. I'm so excited and so happy that, that this has happened. So well done. And I really hope that you feel empowered by this and that we can really, that this is only really the start of, of your engagement and, and collaboration with the different initiatives um, here today. And we're really excited to, to continue to, to share knowledge and support you in your our efforts um, going forward. So well done. Very, very well done. You're um, you're amazing. Great. Exciting. <laughs> Super. OK, so we're, we're, we're doing well on time. So we're going to move on to the next the next part of uh, the webinar. So this is going to be a panel session. So I'm very excited um, to bring together our three panelists. So I'm going to ask Ramesh maybe to pop them up on, on Spotlight. So we have uh, Antoinette uh, Abdan, from, who is the head of uh, Biego uh, City Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Office in the Philippines. We have Faith Malieu, who is a doctoral researcher at the University of Reading in the UK. And we have Rahanul Hay Khan, who is the program, country program lead at Rhymes, Bangladesh. So really happy to have uh, the three of you with us today to unpick um, how we can empower, how can we inspire um, more early career professionals to engage and help to translate early warning into early action? How can they be the connectors like um, Johannes was saying earlier? How can we really think big? How can we put out the asks there for the support that they need to really um, continue to continue these uh, these activities. So um, yeah, I would like to to get us started to unpick this. We have about we have about twenty minutes. So my first question is is about your key lessons on your journey. So you've all had had a journey where you've come to to be working in this space around early warning and early action. And I want you to tell everybody in the audience about the the key lesson that you've really learned on this on this journey, and be that more so on enabling end to end early warning systems, or more about forecast based financing and um, please tell us more about what, what you've um, you've unpicked um, from your journey. So I'm going to start with you um, Antoinette and I know that you've been working on a gender transformative approach in flood early warning systems and perhaps you can tell us a bit more about that. Over to you. Yes good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone. My name is Antoinette Anaban from the city of Baguio. It's the summer capital of the Philippines the current assistant city planning and development coordinator, and at the same time, the head of the uh, city disaster risk reduction and management. I am an economist and environmental by profession. So I want to give you first an overview of uh, what this project is. So the ASEAN uh, Australia Smart Cities Smart Cities Trust Fund is currently supporting Baguio City in implementing the Smart Flood Early Warning Information and Mitigation System project with both the planning for flooding mitigation and the delivery of service of flood early warning and responses using smart technologies. The intended outcome is improved flood early warning system responses and mitigation measures of Baguio. As a complement and to enhance this, an associated project is being implemented specifically to ensure appropriate, applicable and timely early warning reaches the last mile, including the most vulnerable, recognizing that the effective flood early warning systems are people-centric. The gender transformative flood early warning system is structured to feed into the overarching flood early warning system information and mitigation system project. Importantly, by providing specific, usable and relevant actions and guidance on gender transformative approaches that can be built into the design and implementation of the flood early warning system. While this project is uh, still ongoing for the city of Baguio, we already have some lessons learned. Number one is here in Baguio, we realize that gender is a critical consideration in ensuring an effective flood early warning that leaves no one behind. We learned that flood early warning systems that do not explicitly consider gender will likely be gender unequal, thus increasing the marginalization and vulnerability of groups who have less power and influence. Importantly, we believe that proactive efforts are needed to incorporate the needs, priorities, and capabilities of marginal, uh, marginalized gender groups and magnify their voices at every stage of the flood early warning system. Gender transformative flood early warning system should also be coupled with community preparedness to cope with the effects of disaster. 
With this, it is necessary that we will raise the awareness of the communities on disaster risk so that they will all heed to the early warning and act proactively. Also, gender transformative uh, flood early warning system is really very challenging and thus requires a better understanding of the needs of the end users. So uh, that's uh, all I can share for today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Antonia. And that's a really strong message um, for the next generation as well in, in ensuring that really our early warning systems and anticipatory action approaches are really gender transformative. I think that's definitely a growing area. And also, as we heard from the winners of the competition, ensuring um, inclusion, we can definitely make sure that that's um, a strong, strong focus for, for our work going forward. Great, thank you so much. And now I would like to, to pass on uh, to Faith with you. So perhaps you can reflect a bit more about what you've learned on, on your journey and in particular around impact-based forecasting and the Phantom project that you've been working on around uh, forecast-based financing as well. So please, the floor is your, yours. Go ahead. Thank you, Lydia. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. My name is Faith Mizeu. I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Reading but I come from Kenya and actually I'm in Kenya now. And uh, though my journey towards enabling early end-to-end -end early warning system, it didn't start long ago. There is, there is a lot that I've learned. And first is, a, it's a complex process. And it being a complex process is because ideally it means to bring many or multiple actors together to work in an interdisciplinary way to make sure that the four components of an end-to-end -end early warning system uh, is able to inform practice. And uh, mostly what I found out is uh, the complexity is mostly uh, brought about by the normal way we've been working, where we see practitioners or we, we are used to knowing that the hydromet societies are supposed to do the forecasting and issue the warnings, but that's changing because ideally for us to be able to address the other four components, there is need to bring all these actors together. And changing that is kind of bringing the complexity because ideally, especially in developing countries, uh, institutions have been used to working individually, developing tools, developing information individually, but then we are called to create these uh, partnerships and collaborations to make um, this work. So one key thing I've learned, despite the complexity, this can work and we can achieve this because uh, it's not a one day journey and we've seen success stories, for instance, in 20, 20, 2019, the Cyclone Fanny, uh, the, the response was very good where millions of people were saved and it's, it wasn't a one day journey but it was a collaborative uh, journey where uh, you learn lessons, you improve the early warning systems and you make sure that they are able to address the, the populations. And the second uh, part or the second bit of what I've learned is that there is need to put the at least communities at the center of the development of these early warning systems. And this because we need to promote uh, community-led uh, disaster risk management. And I think even the Sendai framework puts it clearly that the at least communities are also supposed to, they have a role to play in the development of early warning systems. But ideally what uh, has been happening is that there is a lot of focus on the forecasting and monitoring and uh, we don't pose to ask ourselves, is this information really addressing the need of the at-risk communities? But if we could look at it in a, in a way that you, uh, we employ the bottom-up approaches, where you look at these communities, talk to them, give them a voice, let, let them talk about the information that they would require. How can they use this information to inform their coping practices, as well as how this information needs to be packaged and uh, disseminated, I think that could be a, a learning point where now with this information, you can now be able to build up on how the forecast needs to be packaged or how this forecast needs to be uh, disseminated to ensure that it reaches the at-risk communities. And I think if we could uh, kind of redefine how we, we approach the early warning systems development, where we now look, we start from the bottom going up I think we could make a lot of progress in ensuring that even the, the, the at-risk communities are rich. And just to end, I want to reiterate the, 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 
a very strong uh, statement that came from the UN Secretary General that the early warning systems are not have not yet reached everyone. And I think probably this is a big question that is being posed to us that we should first of all pose and think why is it not reaching everyone while well, we've seen significant advancement in science and, and technology where we've seen improvement in focusing skills and predictions and longer lean times. Why is this information not helping these uh, local communities? And once we think like that, the researchers and practitioners together, then probably we'll, we'll be able to fill the gaps in the implementation where we'll find, for instance, We've focused so much on the focusing, but then we've not focused so much on the response and preparedness, as well as uh, the dissemination and communication. And I think if you look at, at it that way, we could be able to right. make progress towards uh, ensuring that these early warning systems reaches everyone and protects everyone. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Faith. That was uh, so well put. I mean, two very, very clear messages there in terms of the growing complexity and the need for collaboration. And this is definitely the case. You know, there's a lot of engagement of the humanitarian space, the development space, um, the climate space now. And how can we really unpick all of that and make sure that actually it's the communities and their needs that we're meeting? Um, and no matter how many forecasts we produce, if people are not using them and acting upon them, then they are not actually useful. And, and we really need to make sure that those um, bridges are being built. And I really feel so strongly that, that we can get, if we can get this right with the current and future generations, that there's really an understanding that to enable early warning and early action, we need to build skills in communication. How do we communicate? How can we build better, better communicators? How can we um, inspire uh, new ways of communicating together with the, the communities at, at the local level? How can we really engage and empower communities in the best way as, as we go forward? So I think there's just so much that uh, the next generation can really take from those lessons. And, and thank you so much um, for sharing those. And next up, we have Raihan, and Raihan and myself have um, have worked together in, in Bangladesh on exactly warning communication, and we have um, yeah learned a lot together on this journey. So I'm so happy to be uh, bringing you here to, today, uh, Raihan, and I'm I'm so inspired by you and the things that you're doing in Bangladesh. So I'm looking forward to uh, to hear you share these um, with the wider group today as well. And I know you've been working on the Sufal project around forecast based action, and also many other things together with uh, the flood forecasting and Morning Center and the Bangladesh Meteorological Department. So please, the floor is yours to, to share your lessons on your journey so far. Uh, thank you very much, Lydia. This is uh, Raihan. I am working for RIMES and based in uh, Bangladesh. I'm uh, leading the country program in Bangladesh and also I'm currently acting as the technical lead for RIMES program for South Asia on standarding last mile communication. So I will uh, just pick up where uh, Faith uh, concluded. So uh, basically uh, an early warning information uh, availability doesn't make sure that uh, early actions uh, will take place uh, in the ground, uh, simply because uh, the warning information do not uh, reach at the communities uh, at risk in time and in an actionable format or the information is available in a format which is uh, not accessible for the target communities. We have learned that if warning information can be made available to the at-risk communities in time, in an understandable manner, it can result in a wide range of early action by the communities. Also from our experience of working with uh, communities across the region, we have learned that to make the warning information available at the community level, the information should be communicated through multiple mediums or channels because no single channel might reach 100% of the target groups. Some may prefer to get it on email, some would like to receive SMS or voice messages, others would prefer to get it on TV or social, me uh, social media groups. In all cases, it should be made sure that the information is coming from a single authoritative source. We also learned that disseminating warning to potential recipients in the community can be as good as mass dissemination. So if you can identify some focal points and potential recipients uh, at the community level, it is at, as good as uh, disseminating uh, through mass uh, media. 
However, for institutional level early action, the context is a bit different. The local level institutions or disaster management authorities may fail to act early despite having the warning information in absence of standard operating procedures. The local authorities need to have a mechanism through which uh, they can translate the warning information into early action. Uh, this could be a protocol uh, standard operating procedure or uh, guideline. Uh, we got uh, uh, some few other lessons uh, from the uh, forecast based uh, financing uh, project that is uh, uh, being implemented in Bangladesh. So uh, there are a few projects we came across where the only actions uh, that was adopted uh, in the project was to provide uh, multi-purpose uh, cash grant to the beneficiaries during the anticipated window. However, we have learned from the communities that only providing cash grants may not be sufficient to enable early actions. Rather, we need to look at the broader spectrum of the forecast based action. Sometimes before the disaster strikes, the communities may not even have means to spend the cash for early actions. For example, before the floods, they may require boats or evacu uh, for evacuation or fodder for their livestock, uh, which could uh, become scarce even uh, with the cash in hand. I remember once uh, in a focus group discussion with the Bangladeshi communities, they reported that uh, they received uh, food items before the floods that they that need to be cooked, but they hardly had the provision for cooking. So they demanded to provide fuel and uh, stoves for cooking or supply them with uh, dry food. So a better approach would be to prepare uh, early action plan or we should say crop produce uh, early action plans uh, in hand in hand with the communities for readiness action and mobilize resources when we are anticipating an extreme event. Uh, as Lydia was mentioning, I have worked with uh, the National Hydromet Service uh, uh, provider. So I have, uh, in terms of detection, monitoring and forecasting, I have seen uh, that sometimes the Hydromet Service providers are too conservative about the model accuracy, uh, leading to not uh, implementing an early warning system for a certain hazard until they achieve uh, high accuracy. We learned that instead the communities would get more benefited if we try to utilize the maximum potential of the not to not so inaccurate forecast while the hydromet service providers strive for improving uh, the accuracy. And the final thing I would uh, like to share that there are many projects happening uh, in uh, Bangladesh and across the region and uh, in, the, in the globe, but there are very few projects that uh, work across all the four components of the early warning system. However, we need more projects that cover all the uh, pillars of climate information value chain to create examples of functional end-to-end -end early warning systems and ensure a balanced development of all four components as they are equally important. For example, we might have good forecasting system, but without proper dissemination and communication or without community response uh, to the warning information, the accurate models are useless. So these are the key lessons I wanted to share with you. Over to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Raihan, for sharing that. So again, I think that really complements what we've heard, what we've heard earlier. So really around um, getting those standing operating standard operating procedures in place, making sure those plans are in place and everybody understands their roles and responsibilities. And I think the, the forecast based financing community and anticipatory action has really um, been doing great things in terms of ensuring that there are pre agreed financing uh, linked to uh, linked to early action plans. And I think the next step is really mainstream mainstreaming that that into um, those local disaster risk management plans, response plans, contingency plans, making sure that we're working really closely with governments to actually embed that into, into their planning so that that's business as usual and also for highlighting that complexity around the early action. So there's a lot more than uh, just thinking, okay, one one or two or three early actions are going to fit in different contexts or different communities. They're going to have different um, complexities in terms of actually enabling those early actions to have the benefits and the impact that we want them to have. So again, that goes back to what Faith was saying um, about really in ensuring that we're involving uh, the communities and back to what Antoinette was saying also about the gender inclusion. If we can ensure that women are really actively engaged in all of those processes, then we can make sure that we're getting as much benefit as we can out of the early actions that um, that can be taken. So wonderful. Wow. I think these are this is a, an extremely um, productive, like 10 minutes of highlighting so many important points. I, I'm feeling like I haven't been in a panel where so many important points have come together so fast. So thank you so much um, 
thank you so much for reflecting and sharing and all of that. And I really hope that that's inspiring and empowering the different um, participants today and um, to really take on those lessons and uh, really use them as they go forward in their work and really try and bridge the disciplines and um, cut across the four components of EWS, really work on on the early action plans and, and making sure that happens um, in, in practice. And so I'd like to ask, ask you kind of in relation to that, the next question, which is really about the opportunity that early, early career professionals, young scientists, young, young practitioners uh, and youth as well themselves, um, how can we really support them and, and what do you think is the biggest opportunity for them? So maybe going back to that flash flood that we had, that we had earlier um, just at the beginning. And if you have any advice that you can share for the next generation of leaders, we'd love, love to hear from you as well on that. And after that, just to everybody that, that knows, uh, we'll have a Miro board and we'll be asking for your, your input as well. And we'll also be sharing um, different links related to the different projects that were discussed um, during the panel. So don't worry, you'll get you'll get all of that information. And, and also, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the chat as well. And we'll also have a little bit of time for discussion as well. So first up, back to you, Antoinette. I'd love to hear more about what you think uh, opportunities young professionals um, can really bring to the bring to the table. And if you have any guidance or advice uh, for the next generation. Yes, uh, thank you once again. Uh, while this event focuses on early warning and early actions, I would encourage the youth to be actively engaged in all disaster risk reduction and management initiatives. Since early warning is only one segment of the whole disaster risk reduction and management, we have to consider that all the preparedness activities that we do have implications in the area of response and subsequently in rehabilitation and recovery. Another one is digital Innovation plays a very vital role in improving the delivery of service to the people. Specifically, or specific on the flood early warning system, lead time is very important, but we can only set the appropriate lead time through the real-time gathering of data from the early warning equipment to the database. Also, data gathered periodically will enable us to have a more accurate forecast of hydrometeorological events in the future. Community organizing and uh, on community organizing, uh, let those organized groups, you may, the youth can also be uh, actively engaged in community organizing and let these organized groups serve as an intermediary or intermediator between the communities and local government. Uh, based on our experience, uh, some of the vulnerable and uh, marginal groups, especially those who face multiple access, are not comfortable talking and raising their concerns directly with the local government. And so these organized community groups where they, whom they are uh, more comfortable to raise with should be also be supported by the local government. And also communication skills uh, uh, to vary the stakeholders uh, is necessary, especially that uh, when we, when we uh, send early warning, it should be sent in the most understandable manner. And also, uh, and uh, the very challenging one is uh, when we when we send the early warning to the persons with disabilities, like the blind people who do, who cannot read and the uh, deaf who cannot hear. So another one is deeper understanding on the diverse needs of communities, especially the vulnerable sector and the marginalized sector. So soon when you become a leader, ensure that you're. Uh, you give full support to the vulnerable and marginalized groups. Understand that not all vulnerable and marginalized groups are open to raising their needs to the local government. Hence, you can make uh, you can make or you can establish a channel where they are uh, openly uh, raising their uh, their uh, needs and their concerns, so that it can they can also be properly addressed. Disaster risk reduction and management is also everybody's concern, but requires the proactive support of the local leaders towards a truly inclusive DRRM activity initiatives. So please remember that during disaster, the priority is to save people's lives. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Antoinette. Again, uh, very clear and uh, prominent points there. I mean, definitely there are huge opportunities for youths to really get involved in those local groups and really ensure that we are as inclusive as as possible and making sure that that becomes the norm as we go forward with um, early warning and early action and soft skills, communication skills. It's so important. And, and are we are we 
training our future leaders in those skills well enough and how can we make sure that that we're we're doing that so um definitely lots to lots to digest and think about there thank you again antoinette and faith over to you if you have anything additional you'd like to share or build upon what Annette was uh, sharing yeah, I, I think there is a lot of opportunities for young professionals and uh, this because first they are very open to innovations and also they have embraced technology and uh, looking at the, the multidisciplinary way of how we need to look at the development of early warning uh, systems, I think they have a role to play. But then we need to create an, uh, an enabling uh, environment for them to be able to uh, uh, bring to the table their expertise. And I'm saying that because uh, ideally young professionals or young young from uh, college, from universities, sometimes they don't get a chance to work in institutions that uh, they can be able to apply their expertise. And these are called to uh, these institutions, for instance, the disaster risk management institutions, the hydromet institutions to uh, kind of create an opportunity for these young people and to, to trust them, to give them an opportunity to ideally bring their expertise to the table and see what they can uh, bring forth. Because I think they really have a role to play and they're the people who will uh, empower what you can do in the future or what you can do in terms of uh, disaster risk uh, management in the future. But then if they are not given this opportunity, what happens is uh, uh, the knowledge that they have learned, the innovation, they are just shelved somewhere and they go doing other uh, things that uh, probably is not within their expertise. Then also I want to uh, say probably uh, the curriculums in the universities or in the, in the colleges also need to be redefined. And this because uh, uh, we can't blame the employers, probably they have learned from experience that uh, these uh, youngsters just have learned a lot of theory and no practice. But if we could redefine the way the curriculums are designed in that uh, there is a lot of things to do with how to deal with real life uh, issues, then I think uh, also we could give a chance to these uh, youngsters coming from the university to get a chance to uh, first of all learn these things from the university, but then also be able to apply in, uh, in bringing solutions to the real life uh, 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 issues and in tackling the climate variability and even the extreme events. So I think opportunities are there, but even the practitioners and, 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 and the universities needs to be open to provide these enabling mechanisms for these young people. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Faith. Again, like a brilliant, brilliant point. So the innovation, absolutely. We, the, the young people are definitely open to the innovation and technology. A lot are, are learning new skills, be that machine learning or some of the different the different technologies, earth observation, and making sure that when they do go back to their um, when they do go back to their um, hydromed agencies or if they've been abroad and they're uh, gaining new skills that they really feel empowered and they can actually take on that leadership when they're when they're in um, in their new roles and we really need to try and articulate that and make sure that uh, we can try and facilitate that and, and what role can the different networks around the table here today help to support hydromed agencies to to um, offer, for example, more trainings or different opportunities to also continue to inspire and empower those um, those young professionals who are maybe back um, back in the hydromet agency. So definitely lots to, to think about and, and digest there and also around the role of universities and yeah, are, are the curriculums currently working? My background is, is civil engineering and I never could have even imagined having the, the role that I have now. It uh, was never ever even thought about. I thought I'd be designing bridges um so yeah you just don't know and and uh, we need to inspire the um students and um make them realize what's possible and the impacts that they can um, that they can have so definitely lots to digest there and and if there are any representatives of um universities here around the table today and um, we'd love to get your contributions into the miro board which is um upcoming after we hear from raihan so raihan over to you i'd love to hear more about what advice you have for young professionals and what you think they can contribute specifically I think there are ample opportunities, Lydia, but uh, we need to pave the way so that uh, youths are getting those opportunities. And uh, similar to you, <coughs> for myself, I also never knew that RIMES, an organization uh, that is uh, working in the region, existed. Uh, 
uh, when I was a student. So I think that is uh, very important. For example, uh, I think about uh, the uh, monitoring systems currently in Bangladesh, the auto uh, automatic weather stations, we are importing it. But there, there is uh, no research uh, around that, like uh, to develop those uh, technology within the country. So this could be, you know, like one example, like where youth can, you know, like work in uh, the future and uh, they can really uh, work in collaboration with the uh, universities and the uh, hydromet service providers. So there are three opportunities. I, I would say that uh, all uh, the two other panelists have uh, community in, that in the same uh, line number one uh, the early career professionals and uh, youth are usually more more tech savvy and they help introducing innovative approaches making the early warning more uh, accessible and actionable uh, they can advocate for uh, scaling up uh, of these innovative approaches and share lessons within their network so that it can be replicated in other parts of the world uh, number two, early care professional and youth can uh, help help make the early warning system more inclusive. We have found that uh, women are more proactive in taking early actions if they are well informed. However, in many areas, especially uh, what we learn from Bangladesh, women are disproportionately receiving early warning information. The same goes with uh, youth and children. On the other hand, to make the early warning system more inclusive, a lot more need to be done for the people with disabilities where youth and early career professionals can contribute. Uh, they can also contribute uh, in the early warning message, content development, design inclusive dissemination system, etc. On the other hand, they can help in developing early action protocols, plans that consider the most vulnerable groups, custom actions uh, for women, children, and person with disabilities. Uh, number three, uh, the early career professionals are usually more energetic so they can make a great contribution in community outreach programs. Uh, they can help the last mile end users in the interpretation of early warning information and application of those information into early action. So I have uh, two advice. Number one, uh, ne uh, for the early uh, career professionals and youth, uh, never feel you are a new kid in the town of early warning system. Early career professionals have huge potential to bring about positive changes in the system and promote innovation. Uh, we, in uh, most of the cases, do not uh, need to reinvent the wheel, rather make the uh, wheel more efficient. So that early uh, career professionals can do, definitely. And uh, number two is uh, do not underestimate the capacity of the communities. We often underestimate the capacity of the communities, saying that communities don't understand uh, technical things like danger levels, they won't understand numerics, etc. Uh, we learned that by doing so, we further make it challenging to connect to the communities. Instead, uh, besides making the early warning information more understandable, let's um, also focus on enhancing the capacity of the communities uh, through outreach and uh, sensitization programs. So these are the two key advices from my side. Wow, think? again, amazing messages. Um, this is this is just wonderful. I think they're so so on point. Technology, inclusion, energy, definitely clear contributions that early career professionals can, can bring and making sure that we are actually bringing them into the system. It's a very good point not to feel uh, like an outsider, not to feel like you can come into this space. Uh, we should definitely be very open to new voices, new um, new ideas. We haven't solved it yet. We've been talking about early warning systems for a long time, and we're still not getting there in terms of actually reaching um, all of the all of the population that need uh, warning information and enabling early action. So definitely, we need to bring more people into this space and make sure that they're feeling comfortable and involved and can can really contribute. So that's a brilliant point and. Don't underestimate the community capacity. Absolutely, hundred percent. We've been hearing that uh, from all the all the panelists today. I think it's a very clear message coming coming out. So wonderful, great. Okay, I'm uh, super. 
um, amazed with all of the wonderful points coming from this. Thank you so much for all of the contributions. I'm, I'm seeing lots of happy people in the chat as well and really um, supporting all of the points that are being raised. So I think we're all very much on this on the same page here. So thank you. Um, thank you once again. And before we maybe, I mean, we would like to open the floor to questions. So please do pop questions into the chat. But we'd like to also collect your feedback into the Miro. So I'm going to ask uh, one of my wonderful colleagues from Water Youth Network to pop the the Miro link into the chat and I'm going to do a little bit of whizzing um, to get us some music and I'm going to share this um, in the chat and overall what we would like to really um, what we would really like to understand from you is about how we can um, how we can really support young professionals to actually achieve these things that we've been talking about, be that around risk communication or ensuring inclusion, um, adapting university curriculums, what can we actually um, what do we actually need to achieve that? And, and that can really help us as Anticipation Hub and Associated Programme and Flood Management and the Water Youth Network to really digest this and to think, okay, how can we actually take this forward? What are the practical next steps we can do to really support um, young professionals? So I hope that you're all finding the link. I'm gonna share my screen now and give you a little bit of music. This one, here we go. Great. Bear with me for one minute. I see that there's 13 people here. Great. Oh, I realize I did something wrong. One second. Share sound. Perfect. That is working. Great. And this new timer function. Here we go. I hope you have some music on your side now. So we're going to give you about two minutes to add in um, what support do you think young professionals need to achieve all these things that have been popping up in the panel. Thank you for adding. Great to see it populating for about 30 seconds more. Thank you everybody wonderful isn't this lovely to see well done thank you so much for contributing really appreciate it this is um full of lots of ideas and lots of support that young professionals do need so i'm i'm seeing creating connections with like-minded experts collecting actual field data is complicated so networking could help definitely trying to build those networks at the national and local level how can we support young professionals to to get connected and maybe that's where the universities come in as well um so safe and supportive spaces absolutely to learn ask questions yeah going back to what Rahan was saying making sure nobody feels like they're the odd one out or feeling that they can then can really engage in, and ask questions 
Um, great. Funding for paid internships with relevant organisations. Yes, an absolutely very important point, be that either from a, a master's research perspective or an actual internship and how can different organisations like WMO or DWP or Anticipation Hub and our partners actually uh, support different internships to make sure that we're that they're actually um, getting getting the experience and the practical experience that they that they really need. And that's maybe linking to this uh, field visits one as well. Scholarships to study abroad, absolutely access to education. I think that's um, really important. And then making sure when you come back from education that you can actually step up and take on that leadership role and actually channel your ideas. Great. F funding to support your attendance at different international events and training. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've also been the recipient of, of this as well. And so um, it, it's been really great through Water Youth Network. We've managed to get um, different agencies to support attendance at different events and APFM have been a big supporter there. So really making sure that we bring uh, young people um, to these different high level events because that's where they can support that networking, support the exchange, get motivated, get empowered. Um, so definitely that is something I think that can be taken on board. Research framework, I think um, definitely understanding the research priorities is definitely something we can unpick more. I'm seeing a, a lot of really interesting things here and I'd love to go back to our panellists to maybe reflect on anything that's popping out there for you. Is there anything you'd like to explain or build on from the points that, that you were raising earlier? And I'd love to open, open the floor also. So if anybody um, would like to raise their hand or wants to reflect, we'll maybe first go to our panellists and then uh, then get ready if you want to raise your hand please already do and then we'll we'll come to you in a moment we still have we still have some time so great any any of our panelists like to jump in first or Antoinette would you like to go first I, I can go first Lydia great yeah I think uh, I to reflect more about the research opportunities I think there are a lot of research opportunities out there and the whole the young professional needs to do is to be on the lookout because ideally some of them really do not ask for a lot and the, 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 through these research opportunities you're able to now apply your expertise and, 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 and create something that can add value and especially now that we are trying to address, uh, to, to, um, address the climate issues by uh, transforming the, the climate information in climate actions. I think uh, there is a lot of opportunities that are coming out where uh, youngsters can, can team up and apply for these. And like Rahul said, you don't have to shy away because if you have the expertise, I think uh, you do not need to reinvent the wheel. You just need to connect with the like-minded experts and you can be able to and be able to do something and, and get a uh, get uh, your research or get your expertise out there to address the real uh, climate issues. Absolutely, very good point. Yes, definitely we need to be providing more support like that. Wonderful. Raihan or Antoinette, would you like to reflect? Or, or actually also our, um, our competition winners, Erica and Gabriella, would you like to reflect? You're very welcome to as well. We'd love to hear what you think. Well, I think um youth as um, we have this power to um, collaborate. So the main challenge I see from youth is that um, coming up together as a team and creating those ideas so that even those um, professional decision makers can um, see them and think about them. So in that way, they can make a collaborative efforts on something they want to address, including early warning systems. That's Great. Thanks so much, Eric. Yeah, definitely collaboration, coming together as a team. I think it has to be kind of the norm that collaboration is just, it's just what we have to do. The, the system is so complex and we need to learn how to come together and really make that uh, the norm for our, our young professionals as they're moving through education and, and professional development. So thank you. Thank you for that contribution. Would anybody else like to like to come in? Feel free to unmute or you can pop your hand up. Yeah, may I? Of course. <laughs> Lydia, yeah. may I? Yes, yes. Uh, as I always emphasize, uh, we we have we need uh, the the communication skills, and we see that from the young people, the young professionals, especially that they are so innovative, and uh, they are they know how to to really communicate with the community. So we can use them as channels for the local government to communicate with the 
communities. And sometimes communities do not do not really feel comfortable when uh, they are facing with uh, the local governments or local officials. That's why we have to use, we have to capitalize on these uh, young professionals to do the communication and collaboration and networking with the local communities, especially the vulnerable ones and the marginalized uh, the marginalized uh, sector so they will be the one to bring the 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 to bridge a closer connection of the local government with the communities and one important thing which uh, also mr khan has emphasized is understanding the understanding it is necessary to raise the understanding of communities on disaster risk and the early warning and the, the things that we ask them to 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 do or to prepare for disaster preparedness, they also need to understand that so that they do not need to be reminded and to be informed during disasters, but it's they themselves that will, uh, will uh, it will initiate from them the initiatives that they're going to do. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful. Yes, completely agree. Definitely. And I'd love to unpick more about how we could like what what support we at maybe this global level can actually provide to to support or empower um these kind of conversations at the local level is that small grants is that um access to trainers um yeah what can we really may think? i add to that yes actually in the city of baguio we are open for volunteer activities and that's they can also be there's where we they, they can also come in and learn from that experience we also open not only for preparedness but all in all aspects of disaster governance we are open for uh for uh, volunteerism and exchange actually so in terms of internship in terms of the uh, of engaging them in actual works of disaster res res uh, this disaster risk reduction and management they will learn from that so we can on uh, we can also provide uh, incentives to them like allowances and all and make them feel as they are really part of the organization so that by the time that they are already ready to take on that uh, that uh, professional uh, work then they already they are already aware of uh, what they are going to do. Wow! Yeah, great, wonderful. That's really exciting to hear. Yeah, maybe a model that can be implemented in many other different um, countries. So thank you so much for sharing. Great, Raihan or any anyone else from the team, Adele, Alexa, Nivi, anybody like to to come in? We have about about one or two minutes left. So very welcome to share. Yeah, hi Lydia. Um, uh, I would say that maybe um, one of the things that really stuck with me was uh, Rehan when he spoke about, you know, really a lot of young professionals and youth, they don't feel like they have a voice and what they do won't really make a difference. Um, so that was a very strong message and I wish we could share with everyone. Um, yeah, that you do have a voice and you can feel empowered with your actions and also when he said, um, don't reinvent the wheel. I think that's also very important because people always feel they need to come up with something new and different. And I know we've been stressing a lot about innovation and innovation is very important, uh, but you know, innovation can be defined in different ways. Uh, so yeah, just continue to encourage people. And, and uh, I think we are the future leaders. So maybe in about 15 years, We'll be having this this conversation around a very different table, maybe. So I look forward to that. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much for adding that, Adele. Absolutely, and you're completely right. Yes. Can you imagine the table that uh, the next generation um, of leaders will be sitting around having these conversations, and hopefully, we'll be exchanging around huge successes of uh, community engagement and inclusion and risk communication and warning communication. What is that? How do we want to see see that future? And in twenty years, and in, in the next uh, multi hazard early warning conference of twenty fifty, we're talking about um, all of the successes around inclusion and warning communication, and saying that warnings are reaching two thirds of the population, not one third or uh, even more. You know, these uh, big ambitions and things we can really look forward to to achieving together. And let's let's really work hard to make sure that we are inspiring. Uh, the next generation and we're very committed to that um at the 
Anticipation Hub and also with Water Youth Network and I know the Associate Programme on Flood Management are, have been hugely supportive and we really look forward to, to taking these messages on board and, and seeing what actions, what practical things we can actually um, work forward, work towards um, as we move forward. And one thing I just want to highlight while I have the um, while I have the screen being shared is if you scroll down to the the next map on the on the Miro board. So here you'll find um, all the different links about the different um, projects that were spoken about during the panel. And here you'll also find some um, existing um, tools and, and places that you can find some more information. So around the Water Youth Network, the Early Warning Systems Young Professional Network, also the Disaster Risk Reduction Team in the Water Youth Network, the Associated Programme on Flood Management. We have the Anticipation Hub Newsletter, Anticipation Hub Working Groups. So for example, in the Anticipation Hub uh, Working Groups, we have one around protection, gender and, and inclusion and anticipatory action and this is one that I think we can pick up on a lot of these conversations um, as well and, and how that can really link to the to the youth engagement and the inclusion and gender um, aspects as well so really looking forward to unpicking that more with the um, with the anticipation hub so yes and and in terms of um, other next steps I would love to give the floor to uh, Chim from uh, Cruz from uh, WMO who is very busy organizing the next multi-hazard early warning conference which is going to take place in May and um, Chim is just going to give us a, a quick overview of uh, what's happening at, at the conference and um, ways that we can engage. So great. Thank you, Tim. Yes, wonderful. The floor is yours. Thanks, Lydia. Um, hi, all. Um, nice to meet you. Um, um, my name is Shimon Menyurenda, Assistant Project Officer with the Crew Secretariat, um, helping on the preparations for the third multi-hazard early warning conference. And just to give you a quick, quick update, um, the theme this year is from stock take to scale on target G, accelerating the knowledge and practice of multi-hazard early warning systems for risk-informed resilience. And the conference is scheduled to take place on the 23rd and 24th of May as a pre-event to the Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction in Bali, Indonesia. Um, at the moment, the event will be in a hybrid format, so there will be in-person and online um, participation. And it's currently being organized by the in-use partners, um, currently co-chaired by you know, UN Spider and the WMO. Um, just to update you on the outcomes, um, the, the conference will contribute to the stock take of progress in, in the implementation of Sendai Target G, and the outcome statement um, will feed into the global platform for disaster risk reductions thematic session on early warning and early action that puts forward recommendations to enable transformation for multi-hazard early warning systems, enabling risk-informed early action. Um, also, the conference will contribute to this validated words into action guide on multi-hazard early warning systems, which, which is being um, coordinated by the co-chairs of InMuse. Um, InMuse is the International Network of Multi-Hazard Early Warning Systems. Um, also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the conference organizers have reached out to the Water Youth Network and the Anticipation Hub and IFRC to join part of the organizing committee. Um, there'll be many opportunities for engagements on the topics of early warning, early action, um, anticipatory action. There's also going to be a poster session. Um, information on that will be available hopefully by the end of this month or beginning of ne next month. Um, I strongly uh, encourage everyone here to to register for the conference and the global platform for disaster risk reduction. Um, I'll, I'll put uh, the, the, uh, a link on, onto the chat for, for registration um, and, and thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jim. Yes, it's really exciting. I think these the Multi-Hazard Early Warning Conference has been a, a quite a good milestone for us in terms of the achievements um, with the Early Warning Systems Young Professionals Group. And so this this year, I think this can really be also a very clear milestone in terms of us coming together to define some joint activities and things we can really work together on to make sure we're achieving that support that we need for uh, for young professionals and, and youth going forward. So thank you so much, Tim. And we're very excited to get involved and, and definitely Water Youth Network will be there. And I think Adele is going to be our focal point and we look forward to engaging more people. So please do get in touch if you have ideas and, and we'll try and um, coordinate as things move forward in, in the coming weeks. So brilliant. Thank you so thank you so so much. And yes, we've just hit the top of the uh, the top of the hour, not necessarily, but uh, the end of the meeting, let's say. And uh, just wanted to say a huge thank you again uh, to all of the organizers who were in the back who weren't necessarily at the front of this webinar, but who without them we really couldn't have put it, put it together. So thank you Alexa, thanks you Navidita, Adele uh, and Ramesh for really making this um happen. 
and I'm really looking forward to further collaboration with the Anticipation Hub and the Associated Programme of Flood Management and the Water Youth Network and this is definitely only the beginning and as, as we said we will definitely be following up uh, with an email to you all. This uh, will be recorded, it will be available, you can share it within your networks and we'll follow up with a couple of the extra links but the Miro board will be available um, as well so you can reuse those links um, as well. And um, yes, um, any other small updates? Yes, yeah, so I think there was one other thing around the Water Youth Network and the uh, Integrated Drought Management Programme. I hope I have that right. Um, it's a kind of sister programme to the Associated Programme on Flood, on flood uh, Management and Water Youth Network hope to get more involved in that going forward. So if you see yourself being the potential next Alexa or um, Navita um, and, and supporting Water Youth Network um, as a volunteer with the um, Drought Management Programme, then please do get in touch as well well so we'd love to get more people involved in these kind of opportunities and yes and and for those who may not know so there's also a climate science and humanitarian dialogue which is happening um just after this um if, if anybody is interested to um yeah join that discussion as well so just pop that in the chat as well and yes thank you again thank you everyone thank you to our panelists wow what an amazing discussion in such a short amount of time i'm feeling very very inspired so thank you so much faith uh, to antoinette and uh, raihan and congratulations to our winners again. We are super excited to see um, what where, where your projects are going to go. And thanks again to the huge support from WMO and GWP um, for supporting your initiatives. And yes, thank you. Thank you all so much. And sorry for going two minutes over, but thank you for staying and looking forward to connecting and staying involved um, with all of you. So I wish you all a lovely weekend ahead. Thank you very much.